Conrad and Billy were 11 years old when Rollo first shared with them the secrets of the whaleboat house. It was a Friday after school, a sunny, wind-blown afternoon with choppy waves thumping against a stunt beach, and they had to clear the sand banked up against the doors before they could enter. The whaleboat held centre stage, like a dusty sarcophagus in some ancient tomb. Around it lay an armoury of weapons to ensnare a boy's imagination. Harpoons, lances, axes, grapnels and blades of every description for cutting into blubber. But Rollo directed their attention to the boat itself. He made them trace the sheer lines of its white pine hull with their fingertips. He pointed out the sharp stern end, explaining that the ability to retreat rapidly without turning was vital during the whale's flurry, when a crashing blow from the vast flukes could tear the boat and its occupants apart. He showed them the wooden thole pins, trimmed with leather, to deaden the sound of the oars of approaching doom. And he demonstrated how, in time-honoured tradition, the boat steerer switched places with the boat header in order to deliver the death stroke. Most impressive, though, was the change in Rollo. What had happened to the nervous, downturned gaze, the halting speech, the struggle to put names to all but the most commonplace objects? He spoke with a confidence he had never once displayed in the classroom, plucking technical terms from the air at will. Conrad and Billy must have passed the test, for they were invited to return time and time again. Together they reenacted the, the stories handed down by Captain Josh to his grandson. Rollo standing tall and proud in the stern, barking orders to his depleted crew of two. Slack back, hold water, spring ahead, stern all, before hurling the harpoon into a big burlap sack of hay conscripted to play the whale. With time, willing crew members were found to man the other oars. Then the numbers climbed beyond the capacity of the boat, and tales of inshore rallies made way for grander, more epic yarns of deep sea round the horn whaling that could accommodate a larger cast of characters. There was never any shortage of adventures to be played out. As a young man, Captain Josh had sailed from Sag Harbour on the, ocean on the ocean-going whale ships, the last of three generations of Kemp's to do so. He had made three trips in all, visiting both frosty ends of the globe, rising through the ranks from pimpled greenhorn to chief harpooner. When gas lighting finally put paid to the demand for whale blubber, he returned to the wife and young family he hardly knew, a respected man and a rich one. Like others in Amagansett and East Hampton, fortunate enough to have survived their time aboard the whale ships, he'd had to content himself with sporadic rallies off the ocean beach in late winter. After the speedy finbacks and hostile sperm whales of the southern oceans, the local ripe whales, long on blubber and bone, short on speed, made for easy quarry. Then suddenly, some years before the Great War, the whales disappeared. Inshore whalemen up and down the coast hung up their harpoons. All the gear was stowed away, forgotten. The Kemp's boat hadn't seen the light of day for almost 20 years when Rollo, Conrad, Billy and a pack of other local kids first heaved it out of the whaleboat house under the approving gaze of Captain Josh. The building itself was to double as a whale ship, its boxy construction not unlike the square-stern, blunt-bowed vessels that used to clog the quayside in Sag Harbour, built by the mile and cut off in length as you want them. Captain Josh had said, before dispatching two men into the mastheads to keep watch for whales. A blowhole, they hollered from the roof. Where away? Sperm whale, two points off the weather bow, sir, four miles away. Stand by to lower. And so it continued, Captain Josh marshalling his troop of young actors, feeding them their lines, directing the chase of a particularly feisty sperm whale encountered in the South Pacific which, once ironed, had proceeded to strip all 300 fathoms of manila line out of the boat before dragging it on a heart-stopping Nantucket sl uh, sleigh ride, Captain Josh rocking the boat fiercely to mimic the effect of it crashing over the waves. The whale had fought till the last, capsizing the boat on two occasions before finally expiring. That wasn't the end of it, though. They had lost sight of the whale ship on the long pull back. Then the wind breezed up from the southwest. They were six men in a cockle-shell boat tossed on an angry sea, many hundreds of miles from land, rowing blind in a fading light, dragging a dead whale. When the last vestiges of day dipped below the western horizon, hope went with them. 
Some among them began to pray, not for succor, but final prayers, beseeching forgiveness for sins committed. And then they saw it, a beacon in the night, the distant fires of the triworks burning on the deck of their mother ship, and the strength returned to their backs and arms. Safe alongside at last, one of the oarsmen, a Scotsman, cursed, then kicked the whale that had, cost them, uh, that had almost cost them their lives. Too exhausted for further labour, others were assigned to undertake the cutting in while they recovered on the deck, smoking their pipes. When the first blanket piece was hoisted aboard from the carcass, the block made fast to the main masthead came free, and two tons of suspended blubber felt the fierce grip of gravity. The scene was enacted in sombre silence, the whaleboat's lug sail doubling as the blanket piece, Billy playing the unfortunate Scotsman on whom it landed. The message was clear that Captain Josh spelt it out for the younger ears. Even in death, the whale had sought satisfaction for the disrespect shown it by one of its hunters. It was a lesson they would all be wise to remember. <laughs>